So this lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about Cohen-Macaulay rings. So uh, more precisely about Cohen-Macaulay local rings. So um, remember last lecture we were looking at regular rings or regular local rings and we mentioned a couple of lectures ago that there was a, a sequence of other conditions. We could have local complete intersection rings or Gorenstein rings or Cohen-Macaulay rings or arbitrary local rings. So the last couple of lectures we were discussing regular rings. What we're going to discuss this lecture are the Cohen-Macaulay rings. Um, so Cohen-Macaulay rings, first of all, they're, they're, they're named after two people, um, Irvin Cohen and Francis Sowerby Macaulay. Um, Macaulay was actually a high school teacher. Um, I think this was um, early 20th century when, if you were really interested in mathematics, there probably weren't any university jobs available for you, so you quite often became either a Church of England vicar or a high school teacher. So there are a lot of English mathematicians around that time who were who were either vicars or high school teachers. Um, anyway, um, so let's motivate the definition of a, of a Cohen-Macaulay ring. Um, so first of all, we recall um, here we're going to take R to be local ring and M its maximal ideal as usual. And um, I guess I should say this is going to be notarian as well as local. And we recall that if x in R is not a zero divisor or a unit, then the dimension of R modulo x is the dimension of R minus 1. And this is just an obvious way to work out the dimension of a ring. We keep repeating this. So um, we can take x1, not a zero divisor or unit in R, and then we look at the ring R over x1. And we pick x2, not a zero divisor or unit in R over x1. And we continue like this. We, we then quotient out by x1 and x2. And we take x3 to be not a zero divisor or a unit in R over x1, x2, and so on. And any sequence like this, with this property, um, um, we say um, x1, x2, x3, and so on, is a regular sequence. So this is yet another example of the word regular being heavily overused in mathematics. Um, and we notice the dimension drops by one each time. So the length of the sequence, so the length of the sequence x1 up to xn, so the length is of course just n, is at most the dimension of the local ring R. Um, and we say the ring is Cohen-Macaulay if we can find a regular sequence of length equal to the dimension of the ring R. Um, in general, the largest length of a regular sequence is called the depth of a ring. So a Cohen-Macaulay ring is one in which the depth is equal to the dimension. And I'll start by giving a few examples of rings that are or aren't Cohen-Macaulay. So first of all, um, any ring, any local ring of dimension zero is obviously Cohen-Macaulay because we can find a regular sequence of length zero, which is just the empty sequence. Um, any regular local ring is Cohen-Macaulay. Um, to see this, we notice that regular um, implies that the ring is an integral domain. That's for, at least for local rings. So that's not true for non-local rings. And the reason for this is that if we've got a regular local ring R, and we've got the corresponding graded ring R over M plus M over M squared plus 
m squared over m cubed, and so on. This is isomorphic to a polynomial algebra um, in um, generated, you, you just take a, a minimal set of generators for m, or rather a set of elements of m that, that form a basis for this vector space, and then we, we know that this is now a polynomial algebra over R, and in particular it's an integral domain. And now if we take a filtered ring, like a um, local ring, and look at the corresponding graded ring, if the corresponding graded ring is an integral domain, this implies that our original ring is also an integral domain. And that's very easy because if, if a, b equals naught in R, and suppose that a is in m to the um, m to the i, and b is in m to the j, but a is not in m to the i plus 1, and b is not in m to the j plus 1. Um, but this implies that the image of a, b in m to the i plus j over m to the i plus j plus 1 is non-zero because um, that, that, that's just like multiplying two homogeneous polynomials in a polynomial ring, which is an integral domain. So regular local rings are integral domains, and now we can easily prove that the ring of Cohen-Macaulay because we pick x1 to be some element of m not in m squared, and then we know that the ring r over x1 is also regular, because quotienting out by x1 drops both the dimension and the dimension of the cotangent space by 1, so we can just repeat. And at each step we can find some x1 that's not an integral domain because regular, sorry, that's not a zero divisor, because Regular rings are all integral domains, so any non-zero element will do. So, um, so that shows regular implies Cohen-Macaulay. Well, what about rings that are not Cohen-Macaulay? So let's have an example of a local ring that's not Cohen-Macaulay. So um, here's one. We can just take the ring. Let's take power series in two variables, which is a local ring and quotient out by the ideal y squared xy. So um, let's try and think what this ring looks like. First of all, um, if we just took a polynomial ring and quotient it out by this, its spectrum would look a bit like this. Um, so here we have y, um, uh, it's mostly the line y equals naught, except it sort of sticks out a little bit at the origin. Um, I mean, it doesn't really have an extra point at the origin, but you should sort of think of the point, point at the origin of, of sticking out slightly in one direction. So um, if, we, um, if we take the localization at the point zero, what's really, what it looks like in form is we've got a sort of one-dimensional point of the spectrum that's got a sort of naught-dimensional point sticking out a bit. Um, Anyway, this is this is reasonably typical of what's happening for non cohen macaulay rings because you see we've got bits of different dimension kind of mixed up. We've got a sort of naught dimensional bit intersecting with a one dimensional bit in some sense. Of course, that doesn't quite make sense, but it, this is a sort of informal idea of trying to explain what's going on. Anyway, if we look at this, the maximal ideal m is just generated by x and y, and we notice that all elements of m are zero divisors. So the depth is equal to zero because we can't find any regular sequence in m of length greater than zero. However, the dimension is equal to one, so the depth is less than the dimension, and the ring is not Cohen-Macaulay. Um, well, um, that one is a little bit fishy because it's got nil potent elements. Um, so can we find an example of a Cohn-Macaulay ring with no nil potent elements? So this is not, here we want an example that's not Cohn-Macaulay and there's no nil potent elements. I mean, it's not really surprising we can make things go wrong with nil potent elements. So um, for this one, 
Let's think about the following algebraic set. We take a plane and we take a line going through it and, and we look at the local ring of this point here. So, so um, um, if, this is, if this plane is z equals naught and this line is x equals y equals zero, then the, the, the coordinate ring of this is k x y modulo um, x c y z. And now I'm just going to complete it um, to get a local ring. I mean, we don't have to complete it, we just could just take the localization at the origin, but um, it's easier to write down a completion than to write down the local ring at the origin. So we take the, sorry, there should be a z in there. Um, so we take the power series in three variables and quotient out by x, z, y, z. And now what we have to do is to pick a non-zero divisor. Well, that's quite easy. We can pick the element, um, the non-zero divisor, to be the first element of our regular sequence to be x plus c. And now we have to work out what is our ring k x y z modulo x z y z, and then we also have to quotient out by um, this element x plus c. So that's just setting x equal to what x equal to um, um, minus z. Um, however, if we do that, we get the ring k x y modulo, and now we're just setting z equal minus x, so we get x squared um, y x. And this is the ring of the previous example. And um, all elements of M, all elements of the maximal ideal, are now zero divisors. So we find the depth is equal to 1. Well, actually, we haven't quite found the depth is equal to 1, because I said here we pick some non-zero divisor, and we found we couldn't continue this. And you may well wonder, well, maybe we chose a stupid non-zero divisor, and maybe if we'd chosen a better one, we'd be able to continue it. Um, well, in fact, it turns out it doesn't really matter which non-zero divisor you pick, because um, all maximal regular sequences have the same length, at least for notarian local rings. So that's something we will prove a little bit later. But for the moment, let's just assume it, and we find the depth is equal to 1. On the other hand, the dimension is obviously equal to 2, because we've got a two-dimensional bit there. Um, so it's not Cohen-Macaulay, and it's got no nilpotent elements. I mean, it's, a, it's the coordinate ring of a perfectly good algebraic set, although when we quotient that by a zero divisor, then it does pick up nilpotent elements. Um, so again, this is an example of this ring is not equidimensional. So equidimensional means that all the irreducible pieces passing through a same point have the same dimension. And here we've got pieces of dimension one and dimension two meeting at a point. So um, that's not really, that, that's not very good. Um, so this is an example of a ring that is not equidimensional. In general, um, Cohen-Macaulay rings are always equidimensional. And I'm feeling too lazy to prove that, so you can just look it up in, 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 in the textbook. Um, and uh, you can ask, is the converse true? Is an equidimensional ring Cohen-Macaulay? Well, not quite. I mean, it, it's, it's not far off being Cohen-Macaulay, but, but you, you need to say not only must the ring be equidimensional, but it must also be equidimensional if you sort of slice it a few times. So let's see an example of... Um, so, so the next example is going to be an, an example of an equidimensional ring... Um, with no nilpotence that is not Cohen-Macaulay. So being Cohen-Macaulay really is slightly stronger than being equidimensional. And 
what we're going to do is we're going to take a plane and then we're going to take a second plane and these two planes are going to meet at a point. And they're going to meet at a point in four-dimensional affine space. So uh, obviously in three-dimensional space it's a bit tricky getting, getting two coordinate planes meeting at a point because two planes meet in a line, but in four dimensions we can do this. So, um, so uh, in four dimensions we're going to take um, one of the planes to be w equals x equals zero and the other plane to be y equals z equals zero. So the coordinate ring is k x y um, sorry, I missed out the w, w, x, y, z, and then we should mod out by um, w, y, w, z, x, y, x, z. So, um, uh, so we want to find what its depth is. So, so we have to pick a non-zero divisor. And if we pick a non-zero divisor, we can pick the first element of our regular sequence to be x1, which is w. Let's just pick w minus y. We have to be a little bit careful. We can't pick a um, we can't pick a polynomial in that, that, that's just a polynomial in w and x because then it will be killed by y. And we can't pick a polynomial that's just in y and z because it will be killed by x. So we we have to pick a non-zero divisor that has something in these two variables and something in these two variables. Um, and um, here we're going to take our ring R to be the completion of this. So it's kW x y z modulo w y w x x y x z. And if we take x1 equals this, then we take the ring R modulo x1, and now we're just identifying w with y, so we're going to get the, the ring k x, y, z, modulo y squared, y, z, x, y, x, z. Um, and let's try and think what the spectrum of this ring sort of looks like. Well, um, 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 we, we've got the plane um, y equals zero and um, we, we, we can have these planes um, either x equals zero or y or z equals zero, but um, so, so, so the spectrum contains two lines, but it also contains a sort of little bit sticking up at the origin. So, so we can think of this, um, this plane as being where y is equal to zero. Um, but there's a sort of infinitesimally little bit sticking out because if x and z are both equal to zero, then then we don't quite get y squared y equals zero. We only get y squared equals zero, which means y can sort of be be a sort of infinitesimally small non-zero number if in, 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 in some rather meaningless sense. So if we take r modulo x1, um, we've suddenly picked up a sort of little nil potent bit in our ring. And just as in our first example, this now means that um, all elements of the maximal ideal of r over x1 are zero divisors. So we find the, the depth of r is equal to 1, but its dimension is obviously equal to 2. So again, this is an equidimensional local ring that's not cone macaulay um, Well, um, we mentioned that we were cheating a little bit because we haven't yet shown that if we picked a different x1 here, we might be able to find a non-zero divisor in the quotient. So um, now I want to fix this. So um, we want to show that any two regular sequences, any two maximal regular sequences in a Noetherian local ring have the same length. 
And an easy way to do this is to use a little bit of homological algebra. Um, so um, more generally, we can define depth for a module M. So in other words, um, a regular sequence for M is a sequence x1, x2, and so on, xn, with xi in the maximal ideal of our local ring, and x1 not zero divisor of m, and x2 not zero divisor of m over x1, and so on. So you can define depth for modules over a local ring as well as the depth of the ring. And the following are equivalent. Um, first of all, there is a regular sequence for m x1 up to xn of length n. Secondly, x the i of r over m, m is equal to naught for i less than n. And thirdly, any regular sequence can be extended to one of length n. So, um, if we can prove that these three are equivalent, then um, all maximal regular sequences have the same length because part three says that any regular sequence can be extended to one of length n. And you see this second condition here is a condition about the module m that says nothing at all about elements of a regular sequence. So, 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 um, so, so the maximal value of n doesn't depend on which regular sequence we're choosing. And if you choose m to be the module r, then this shows that the all regular sequences for the ring r have the same length. So we're going to prove this as follows. We're going to show that condition 1 implies condition 2, and condition 2 implies condition 3. And we don't need to show that condition 3 implies condition 1, because condition 3 implies condition 1 is completely trivial. So we've just got to show that 1 implies 2, and 2 implies 3. Um, so to show that 1 implies 2, so that means we have a regular sequence x1 to xn, which is regular for m, and we want to show that um, x to the i of r over m and m equals naught for i less than n. Um, so by induction, um, this, meaning this bit, is zero for i less than um, n minus one. And now what we do is we look at the following um, exact sequence. Um, um, and we know that th th this is multiplication by x1, and this is exact because x1 is not a zero divisor. So this is where we use the fact that x1 is not a zero divisor. And you know if you've got a short exact sequence of modules, there are some rather bewildering long exact sequences for x that you can never remember properly. Well, I'm just going to write down the one we need. The one we need says that x of i minus 1 r over m, m over x1 m, maps to x to the i of r over m, m, maps to x to the i of r over m, m. So, um, um, now, uh, by induction, this is zero. So as this is exact, it means this map here is injective. 
However, this map here is multiplication by x1, and we notice that x1 is 0 on r over m because x1 is actually in m. So this map is injective and it's also 0. Well, if you've got an, if the 0 map um, from a module to itself is 0, this implies the module itself must be 0. So x to the i of r over m, m is equal to 0. Um, um, which is um, uh, what we wanted to prove. So, sorry, I should have said we're taking i to be n minus 1 here. Um, so now we want to prove that condition 2 implies condition 3. So you remember condition 2 says that x to the i of r over m and m is equal to naught for i less than n. And condition 3 says that any regular sequence can be extended. Uh, to one of length um, one of length n. So, so we, we, we're trying to prove that this condition implies that condition. So we first suppose n equals 1. Then this the, 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 then this condition here becomes hom r over m to m equals zero. Um, so um, this means that m is not an associated prime of m, because if it was an associated prime, m would have a submodule of this form. So this map here would, would be, would be non-zero. Now, now the zero divisors is just the union of the associated primes. And the union of the associated primes can't be the whole of the ideal M because M is a maximal ideal and there are only a finite number of associated primes and the maximal ideal can't be the union of a finite number of primes by prime avoidance. Um, so, M has a non-zero divisor. Um, um, so that there is um, a regular sequence of length one. So for n equals 1 to do this. Now for, any, for n greater than 1, I'm just going to be very brief here, we pick a non-zero divisor x1 in m um, and apply induction to m over x1 m. And um, what you can do is you can now show that this module here has a similar property except that this only vanishes for i less than n minus 1 and for that you use exact sequences of x and I'm feeling a bit bored of writing out exact sequences of x and I'm going to get them wrong anyway so I'll, I'll leave this as an exercise. Um, so we've got two corollaries of this. Um, first of all Um, any two maximal regular sequences for of M or R have the same length. So when you're trying to find a regular sequence, it doesn't really matter very much which element you pick as your first element because you'll still be able to extend it to a a, a regular sequence of maximal length. So, so all that worrying about it we did earlier was unnecessary. Um, another corollary is that any quotient of a regular local ring by um, a regular sequence, possibly non-maximal, is Cohen-Macaulay. Um, that's because um, if you take 
your regular local ring R and you quotient out by x1 up to xi, then this is dimension is equal to the dimension of R minus i. And um, you can extend this to a regular sequence of length um, dimension of R. So this has um, a regular sequence of length dimension of r minus i, which is equal to the, its dimension. So for example, um, any hypersurface singularity is Cohen-Macaulay. So um, you probably haven't come across many singularities that aren't hypersurface singularities. So most of the singularities you've seen will be Cohen-Macaulay singularities. In particular, for example, any singularity of a plane curve is automatically a Cohen-Macaulay singularity, has a Cohen-Macaulay local ring. Um, OK, the next lecture we're going to be talking about um, something you can construct out of a regular sequence called the causal complex. And as one application of this, we will show that if you've got a regular sequence for a Noetherian local ring, then any permutation of that is also a regular local sequence, which is not at all obvious from the definition.